East Asia and Southeast Asia account for almost a third of the world's population. Some of the world's biggest and fastest growing economies are based in Asia. However, there exists a noticeable gap in development. East Asian countries, in particular such as China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, are all among the world's largest economies. They have undertaken successful plans of industrialization that have seen incredible transformation since the end of World War II. Together, these countries combine for a GDP of almost $30 trillion. On the other hand, Southeast Asia remains problematic. Many countries such as Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines, and Indonesia have all struggled to successfully make the leap from developing to developed economies. Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines have a combined average GDP per capita of $7,000. Compare this to East Asia, where Japan and South Korea have a GPD per capita of $40,000 and $31,000 respectively. So why is this the case? What worked and what didn't? On one hand, the countries in East Asia determinately stuck to very similar policies and goals. They were strict. Conversely, Southeast Asian countries wavered in their economic planning, and they all too often lacked a clear plan of attack. In order to examine the progress of these regions, it's best to go back to the years following the end of World War II, and the policies these governments embarked upon. The economic journalist Joe Studwell writes that what has always been required is proactive interventions. Studwell argues that robust economies were built on the early accumulation of capital and technological learning. For developing countries, this all starts with agriculture. These populations typically have large numbers of available labor, ideally suited for carefully managed agricultural programs. When these programs yield enough food and capital, the transition to more urban-based populations is feasible. Crucially, it all depends on the agricultural programs. In the post-war years, Southeast Asian countries tended to stick to plantation-based farming. This meant the emphasis was on big profits for large sizes of land. Big profits for wealthy landowners, but little incentive for the masses working on the farmlands. This leads to weaker yields. And this was in stark contrast to East Asia, where governments opted for high yields and self-sufficiency in food production. Japan, China, South Korea, and Taiwan allocated small plots of land for the masses of people willing to farm small acreages. Everyone was given the opportunity to farm their own plot of land for agreeable terms. The government paid farmers fairly for essential crops like rice, which led to higher incentives and motivation to properly farm the land and produce continually greater yields. East Asian countries realized that being self-sufficient meant the surplus income could now be spent on the next crucial stage, manufacturing. In Southeast Asia, this was quite the opposite. By focusing on plantation-based farming, countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines failed to reach a satisfactory level of self-sufficiency. Indeed, these countries were still importing too much of their rice. This failure to create high-yield production prevented these countries from building the necessary base for manufacturing economy. Again, East Asian countries showed incredible resolve in taking their economies to the next level, which was critical for growth. Against the advice of developed nations and organizations such as the World Bank, East Asia opted against relying on the forces of the free market. Instead, they began a strict program of developing industries under tight government control. This included acquiring technological know-how from already developed nations. Japan modeled its path on the successful growth of Germany. Similarly, South Korea took many of its cues about how to modernize production from Japan. Hyundai took much of its technology from Mitsubishi, which in turn led to the ultimate success of the giant corporations known as Hyundai and Samsung. And the governments of the East Asian countries pushed for international competitiveness. Export-based economies were the only way forward. Companies that performed well were supported, and those that did not were either culled or forced to align with their competitors. Again, this was a far cry from the policies in Southeast Asia. Governments failed to successfully implement export-driven pressures onto local industries. For example, Malaysia's biggest car company, Proton, has failed to reach any great heights of the international stage. Although the Malaysian government supported the growth of Proton in the late 20th century, it still failed to come close to the success of the East Asian powerhouses like Toyota and Hyundai. By favoring local component suppliers and the Malaysian administration, Proton lacked the technological advantages and knowledge that came from learning from such developed nations. Contrarily, Japan and South Korea realized the need for production quality that would compete on the international stage. Advisors from overseas were consulted in order to confirm that their processes were heading the right direction. 
Steel and automotive experts from Australia, Japan, and Germany performed quality assurances to keep the East Asian countries on track with their manufacturing targets. China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan have also concentrating on increasing education degrees in science and engineering. China in particular has seen enormous growth in graduates in industries over the past 20 years. In 2002, around 400,000 people earned degrees in these technology-focused areas. In 2020, this had quadrupled to almost 1.6 million. And while the East Asian banks were carefully regulated by governments, Southeast Asian banks were much freer-willed in their lending. South Korean and Japanese banking systems were leaned on by their governments to provide loans only to export-driven companies. Funding was provided with strict controls in order to protect against fluctuations in global capital flows. And finally, towards the end of the 20th century, Southeast Asian countries were finally starting to develop competitive manufacturing industries, albeit inferior to those of East Asia. China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan have continued to invest in technology and have created economies based on high-tech products. These countries were able to successfully export to the world by ensuring that their products were superior in quality. Now, this could only be achieved by ensuring local competition, where the strongest would survive. Japan was able to create enough competition in its automotive industry for Toyota, Honda, Nissan, all of them to thrive. Whereas Indonesia, Astra remained the only major car manufacturer. With no pressure to boost exports, Astra simply sat back and relied on its domestic profits. The future for Southeast Asia is hard to predict. With aging populations and political instability, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Indonesia may have missed the boat in adapting to high-tech manufacturing. Still, some such economies like Hong Kong and Singapore have shown the way forward by concentrating on highly developed service industries while encouraging heavy foreign investment. The success of East Asian economies provides a glimmer of hope for developing countries in Africa and South America. With large available working populations utilized alongside carefully planned policies, it might be possible to follow the paths of South Korea and Japan. And history has shown us one thing. Perhaps the best way to transform from a developing to a developed economy is through tight government controls, land reform, then a shift to export-driven manufacturing and technological products. Furthermore, the people in East Asia countries got, they gotta get on board with their government policies and bought in. They transferred their fantastic work in agriculture to their technological industries. So, in summation, good policy, but also sacrifice and hard work. Truly, they pay off.